Um, I'm, a I'm kind of blown away by um, the stories that I'm hearing, but thank you for um, to Skull for asking me and having me. Um, and my aha moment is a bit random, but I hope my story will show that I kind of believe in random. Um, and like most people, my initial engagement around the issue uh, was random. I started in the late 1990s uh, looking at the issue of sex trafficking with Gillian Caldwell, and then by 2005, I was supporting and celebrating NGOs through an organization, Vital Voices, um, at their annual event at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. And it was their co-founder, Milan Vivir, who called me and said, would you be interested in becoming a United Nations goodwill ambassador against trafficking and slavery? And I immediately said, absolutely no way. <laughs> um, and I said that not because I'm an awful human being, although maybe some people at school forum might think, oh, that's awful. Um, but I said that because at the time, the picture that we were seeing was that the vast majority of this was sex trafficking. And it's not that I didn't think, yes, that's urgent to solve, that's <coughs> devastating for the individuals. It was because I couldn't see solutions to it and, and, and I felt that that was vital. I saw it as a government and a police enforcement challenge. And I said to Milam, I can't see the solutions to this and, and, and I can't see my personal connection to it. Um, and so no, and she very sweetly said to me, get over yourself um, and get out there, uh, take on the role and use it to investigate and get a bigger, deeper picture. Um, and so all of my trips have taught me that probably the only accurate presumption that I can have is that I will never um, get beyond my inaccurate presumptions. Um, and the first one, the underlying one that I had, was that I was blessed because I lived in a country that respected human rights. Um, and I was free and I was privileged because of this random luck of where I was born. And yes, that was awful but that I, that I wasn't causing it. Um, and I think that was what was underneath it. The first trip that I took, however, was to Lake Volta in Ghana. Lake Volta is the second largest man-made lake in the world. When they created the lake, they didn't clear the trees. So the fishing there is fantastically difficult. You can see it's this bizarre landscape with these sodden tree trunks sticking out of the lake. Um, and Local NGOs there had discovered <clears throat> this issue and taken action against it because of the numbers of children's bodies that were washing up on the shores. So I went to meet with them. Sorry, one of those white people going out there. I went to meet with them and I met with child survivors who told me about how they were beaten with oars in order to make them dive deeper into these cold and dangerous waters, sometimes at night, to disentangle the nets that were caught on the trees and how they had to calm fish as big as their arm span. And they would do it by finding the face of the fish and squeezing the eye sockets to calm it. And the trick was to not get your fingers trapped in the gills because then the fish could overpower you and that's how they'd watch their friends drown. Um, and sorry, late to self-learn your script. So there are thousands of um, there are thousands of these kids believed to be trapped on little islands in this vast lake. But we went to look at it at the shore. And I knew that um, I knew not to expect that I was going to see guns and chains, that this was about coercion. But I didn't expect not to be able to see it at all. And I found myself as, yes, uh, the now heavily sweating, horrible white European lady with her presumptions, um, looking at this person that they were looking at and thinking, well, I'm, I'm completely confused because he seems quite healthy and robust to me. And obviously my underlying presumption was that I was going to see somebody emaciated and starving 
as an indicator. Um, and eventually I had to confess, I'm sorry guys, I really, I don't know what I'm looking at. Um, I, can't, I can't see it. And what they said, what they described is, the boy is this guy here on, on the left. What they said is, we can tell from his height, he's probably about 12 years old. Um, uh, but he's built like a man. Right? He's really muscular. That tells us that he's probably done about five years of hard labor. That's a child at risk. I wouldn't have seen that. And it, w it was actually talking to local experience that helped me see that and many other um, presumptions. Now, I got to walk away. But as I did, I asked slightly uneasily, um, where does this fish that they catch, or they're forced to catch, where does it end up? Like, have I ever, <laughs> have I ever eaten this? I was brought up on fish fingers. You know, I, have I ever actually eaten this fish? Could I have paid for it? Have I ever fed this fish to my child? And um, I realized when I got home, they went kind of quiet. I realized when I got I couldn't find out because companies aren't required legally to disclose that information. Um, and my other trips around the world started to support the idea. Yes, it is. It's in every, almost every country in the world. And it's in almost every product supply chain. And suddenly my so-called blessed free life, which was completed by my cell phone, my computer, my car, my coffee, my clothes, my, my, my food, my whatever, was supporting a system that trapped people most likely at some point in enslavement and forced labor. And it completely debunked the myth of my freedom. Martin Luther King talked about how all life is interrelated, um, that we are tied together by a single garment of destiny, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I still find those words incredibly inspirational. I, they're very moving to me, they're very special, but I struggle as a regular human being to feel that I am implementing that in, in daily, daily steps and daily choices that I'm able to make. I don't know how to walk that walk. Um, but as we walked towards the lake, the NGO that I was working for spotted a suspected trafficker and they said, come on, we're going to talk to him. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to feel not just sweaty, but anxious. Um, and I've come all the way from the Kennedy Center, Washington, DC, and I've traveled all the way to Africa to try and find this connection. And I'm actually just feeling scared and not very good well ambassador -y. And, and I, so we get to the thing, and I'm like, what am I going to say to him? I, don't, I haven't really thought about that. And, and I'm scared because I am worried about the danger aspect. And I'm completely disarmed because when I look up, I see this young man with a fresh, open, smiling face. And it's completely not what I'm expecting. And then I see his T-shirt. <laughs> and it's at the Kennedy Center, Washington, DC. And some people, if I share that story with them, will go, huh, weird. Um, <laughs> and they're totally entitled to feel that way. Um, but for me, everything kind of stopped. And yeah, it was really humbling and it was really um, moving for me. Um, my aha moment helped me answer my question, who is doing this? Uh, all of us, and it, it helped me have conversations with the traffickers as well as the traffic. And I asked this ex-trafficker, what was your aha moment? What was the thing that inspired you or helped you to free yourself and liberate yourself and come out? And he said, um, it, was when, it was when they asked me, would you do this to your own child? And I thought, oh, okay. And it took me a while to realize that I was enabling my life. I was enabling the life of my own child while putting other children around the world at risk and their families, maybe even fatally. Um, and that it was meeting these people face to face and talking to them, sharing that narrative, sharing the stories that, that really brought that home to me. I, I was a concrete, 
participant in global economic apartheid. Um, we now know that for every one person forced into the sex trade, four people around the world are forced to work. The selling of children is the fastest growing global crime. My aha moment helped me to come home, uh, found the organization Asset, and we work on systemic solutions. And we chose uh, to originate a legislative solutions, one of many in the space, um, that is the transparency and supply chains law. And this is a consumer rights disclosure law that requires the major manufacturers of California to disclose what their practices are throughout their global product supply chain <coughs> to eradicate trafficking and slavery. With a lot of help and a lot of support, it passed in 2010, came into effect in 2012. Um, of the recent evaluation of, uh, uh, we've evaluated 1,961 companies incorporated by the, by the law, which doesn't sound like a lot of companies. We recently found out it, uh, it's evaluated as $48.4 trillion in, um, in global trade. Thanks to the Transparency and Supply Chains Law Going Global, it's now incorporated in the UK Modern Slavery Act. It's now 20,000 companies. And our hope and our work is to increase the understanding of, of what that is, what disclosure is giving us in order that we can continue to break denial. I do believe it's helped break denial. And I believe it's a tool to propel solutions going forward. My aha moment. I think helped me because I went out to Ghana with a bunch of horrible white presumptions, clearly, um, and with a bunch of questions. And so now when people ask me, where is it worst, I say, in my own home. Who is doing it? Me. Why is it happening? Denial. And who, who can solve it? All of us. And it has to be all of us because one person in isolation is not going to ever be enough. It's not going to stop it from happening. So the ultimate aha moment for me was that with the right information helped by ever-evolving transparency and the right skill set interpreting that information can move us towards a solution for all of us so that on a daily basis, every time we make a choice and spend a dollar or a euro or a pound or a ruble, we can vote for the world that we want. I'm going to come back here. Okay. Okay. I need to okay. <laughs> my water bottle. Okay. Um, thank you. So um, I just want to ask you one question around the, the Transparency and Supply Chains Act is something mm -hmm. you're so proud of and is so important. I want to see if you can help make it clear for everyone um, since it's really not about blaming and shaming, it's about exactly what it sounds, transparency. Like, how do you see that leading to the real change that you're hoping happens? Well, obviously, we've got a long way to go with it. This is the California version is step one. It's a foot in the door. It's not the complete story. Um, and I almost put a slide up that said, um, beware of the bull. Um, because what we found is that Companies own land rights, factories, farms. Uh, where people work is a land right issue. You're not allowed to just walk in, find the person in trouble, and walk them out. It's more complicated than that. And so what we need, transparency is a window into the best, into the practices that companies are using. Um, and that transparency to me is agnostic. It's an agnostic open source tool. And agnostic sounds, agnostic sounds kind of cold. It's basically universal. If you're somebody that wants to use protest, that is angry about it, that wants to use that methodology, it can help us rate companies by what they're doing. So I think it creates a market for solutions to get traction. Um, and I think that it's, I really think it's a way forward to help us see who's doing what. And then we can start as consumers to support people who we think are doing the right thing. And it challenges companies who otherwise were able to hide behind the fact that nobody was talking about it. You have great actors in the space 
who would say to us, we don't want to talk about it. It's like we're going to look like the bad guys by stepping up and talking about forced labour in our supply chains. And the others are just sort of sitting there going, go on, that'll affect your brand. Now I think there's an increasing level playing field that enables them to do that and start to share best practices. And it, it's left to the others. If you don't think this is your problem and you trust that your consumer is still going to go with you, go for it. I don't think that's sustainable, but I can't persuade every one of them around to my opinion, and I don't think you have to. So what's your favorite YouTube song? <laughs> um, I, uh, I had to look it up. Iris held me close. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your personal journey with us. Thank you.